Hello, everybody. I'm delighted, absolutely delighted that you can be with us for what is going to be a fascinating conversation. I can tell you already because we've been having a bit of a chat in the green room already. I'm going to be chatting to somebody who can be described basically as a living legend. He is the co-inventor of the internet, a man who has brought us the future and today is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google, none other than Vint Cerf himself. And we've got so much to discuss today because I guess when you're talking about the internet, you're, you're talking about everything that's going on in the world and beyond. So hang in with us. We've got half an hour of fascinating chat. Let's get going. And just to introduce myself, I am Isabel Kumar. I'm a journalist and I am delighted to have been chosen to host this conversation. Hi there to you, Vint. Well, good afternoon, Isabel. Thank you very much for an opportunity to chat. I'm looking forward to the questions that you have, and I hope that, we'll, that our audience will find both the questions and the answers of interest. I'm sure they will. Well, listen, uh, Vin, let's cast our minds back a bit. Let's go back to the 70s, to the 80s, when all this work on the internet was in its infancy. Um, did you ever, for one moment, were you able to kind of conjure up the enormity what you were working on, the enormity it would have in our lives, and I guess the invisible nature that it has in our lives today, this almost tentacular kind of approach that the internet has and, and governs everything that we do to a certain degree. Well, it, you know, the easy answer, of course, would either be say no or to say yes, of course, we knew all this was going to happen, uh, but neither would be true. Uh, we knew that we were working with very powerful technology. We had the uh, experience with the ARPANET, the predecessor uh, network, which tested packet switching and which also allowed us to demonstrate that computers of different brands could still be made to interoperate with each other. We were building this around the notion of uh, computer-based command and control for the US military. And so the focus of attention was not just on data, but voice and video as well. And although in those days, in the late 70s and uh, early 80s, the amount of voice and video that we could carry was limited because the data rates on the underlying transmission systems were still quite small. Uh, we were already aware that we needed that capability that would have been specifically for the command and control application. But the people who were doing this work uh, were graduate students and researchers in academic settings. And of course, we put the technology to work to forward our research and to cooperate and collaborate with each other to share each other's computing resources and software. So we could see that this was really powerful stuff. Email was, was developed in 1971 on the original ARPANET before we began connecting other networks to each other to form the internet. So uh, we had mobile radio capability way back in the, in the mid to late 1970s, you know, just as we do today with the mobiles that you carry, except these were cubic foot radios that cost $50,000 each. But we were demonstrating capability like that. I don't think though that we had quite the same picture of carrying around a computer in your pocket with five radios on it and you know a million apps. Uh, that was, even though there was a comic strip called Dick Tracy uh, in the US and he had a wristwatch radio, which I remember that in the thirties. And then of course it graduated to a video thing, which of course is a reality today. There are video wristwatches available. So um, it just tells you that fiction uh, may race ahead of reality, but it, but reality somehow sometimes has a way of catching up. Uh, I think of engineering as turning science fiction into reality, and that's kind of what's happened. I will say, though, that, that one of the most transforming events comes in 2007, which is not all that long ago, uh, when the iPhone appeared, because two technologies uh, that had been invented at the same time in 1973, Bob Kahn and I start working on the internet design, and uh, the handheld mobile uh, gets started in the same year. And uh, the two are running in parallel, you know, completely independently. And then in 1983, both of them get formally turned on. The internet goes operational in January of 83. And sometime in 1983, the first uh, mobile telephone service gets started at Motorola. 
And Marty Cooper, uh, of course, is the original inventor of this notion of handheld telephony, wireless uh, telephony. Uh, and the two run in parallel from 1983 on until 2007. And then Steve Jobs comes up with the idea that we ought to be able to carry the internet around in our pocket, roughly speaking, which he does. And of course, now suddenly the mobile phone makes the internet more accessible because anywhere you get a, you know, enough bars, you have access to everything on the internet. And of course the internet makes the mobile phone more useful because of all of the content that's on the internet and the activities that you can support. So those two were hypergolic. Uh, they, they ignited uh, when, they, when they were joined. And uh, the result, of course, is what we see today. And the result, as you say, is what we see today. And most of us take having access to the internet really for granted. But by the same token, that's not the case for everybody. And you know, the UN has said that access to the internet is basically a human right. Do you do you agree with that declaration? I, I have, you know, I wrote an, an op-ed in response to that claim mm -hmm. in the New York Times, and I got I got dinged for my position, which I said I thought elevating access to the internet to be a human right seemed a little extreme, and and the reason I felt that way is I didn't think a particular technology should be anointed in that way. Mm -hmm. and the reason I felt that way is that I imagined that a hundred years before. Having a horse was a really important thing. And you know, you had to know how to take care of your horse and you know, you had to have a barn to put it in and all these other things. And now, and and so would you have said a hundred years ago that having a horse was a human right? And and I thought that didn't sound quite right. On the other hand, if you had a horse and it was important to your way of life, to your livelihood, and somebody took it away. They'd be taking away your ability to work, for example, and that sounds wrong. So if you had access to the internet, somebody took it away, and it feels like it would be a violation of your human right of expression, of ability to assemble, uh, to uh, have access to information, which starts to sound a little bit like the uh, First Amendment rights that we have in the United States. So I took the view that, that, that if we couldn't guarantee that everyone would have access to the internet. But I suppose when you think about um, other human rights that we talk about, whether it's food, clothing, shelter, uh, we can't guarantee everybody has that either. And yet we strive for that. And so I've become a little more comfortable with that formulation, even though I imagine that 100 years from now, there'll probably be something else that's even better than the internet, which we will consider to be a human right. And then we'll say, well, what about the internet? And said, well, you know, we don't need that anymore. And now, of course, you might have, instead of that one horse in the barn, you have 275 horses in your garage. Uh, and, the, and it produces a different kind of pollution. So, so I, I do think, though, that it enables an enormous amount of human right. It enables uh, the free flow of information. It enables people to work, even if they can't be physically in, in some location, as we've experienced with the pandemic. Yeah, so, so you... So you say, so to, to interrupt, so what you're saying is used in the right way, it mm -hmm. is an enabler of human rights, but it yeah. isn't a human yes. right per se. Yes, that's a much better formulation than I'm, at least I'm more comfortable with. That's interesting. And so then in terms of that, I think uh, there's another figure that I'd just like to, 37% of the world's population still doesn't have access to the that's internet. Correct. So, so what do you think are the most important actions then that you know stakeholders need to take to achieve this universal uh, internet access, but also I think make it meaningful because again, if it's gonna be an enabler of human rights, it has to be a meaningful access. So uh, thank you. That's a really rich way of formulating the question. And uh, I would approach this in several ways. The first one, of course, is just the physical facilities required to make the internet work. So we need radio towers and uh, we need electricity to make things run. Computers don't work well without it. Um, we need to have physical uh, pipes, you know, optical fiber, uh, satellite links. There are a variety of physical facilities that have to be in place and they have to be, somebody has to pay for them. And the net result, pun intended, uh, it still has to be sustainable and affordable for everyone. Because if it's not affordable, then it won't work. And if the costs don't get paid for, it won't work, at least not for long. So we have to cover all of that um, by, uh, uh, by building the infrastructure, creating the right 
terms and conditions and policies that will enable the investment that's re required. But that all that does, that's leading the horse to water, just to you know, borrow on a previous analogy. Uh, making it useful for someone requires some education. You have to know what you can do, how you can do it. You have to understand what might be unsafe in that environment. Uh, you have to know how to, how, to be, you know, how to do safe networking. And on top of all that, you have to learn how to use it in a beneficial way. So uh, that's, that's gonna require education. Isn't it always true? Everything boils down to educated workforce. Uh, in addition to all the other uh, financial and technical requirements to make it useful. Uh, then we run into the problem, which you might already be preparing to ask about, and that's the situation where these same neutral infrastructures are abused by people who have their own interests at heart, but not yours. Whether that's the denial of service attacks or disinformation and misinformation or malware or ransomware, or a variety of bullying and just a huge range of harmful behaviors are possible in this environment. And we have to figure out how to defend against that. We need an educated populace and we need frankly law enforcement and we have to have international agreements uh, to uh, blunt the effect of these kinds of abuse. And that requires cooperation and accountability. So we have to be able to identify people who are doing harmful things and bring them to justice. And that sometimes requires real international engagement because the victim can be on in one jurisdiction and the, the perpetrator in another. Yeah, and that, that brings along a whole range of complexities, doesn't it, when it comes to this kind of online crime? And you're right, it, it was leading me to my ne next question, because you, yeah, so the, the technical side is the easy bit, but really in terms of ensuring that the internet is a source of good, that's the difficult bit to achieve. And as one of the fathers of the internet, in personal terms, how much of a sense of responsibility do you feel in terms of guiding the internet in the right direction? Well, you know, it, it's uh, largely out of our hands at this point. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know if you have kids, but the one lesson I've learned is that uh, you don't want to take too much credit when your kids do well. So when they screw up, you don't have to take too much blame. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, I feel as if Bob Kahn and I, and, and literally tens of thousands of other people have helped to build the highway system. And we've offered rules of the road for getting vehicles onto the highways, you know, split them, don't, don't go in all directions at once, you know, stay on one side of the road or the other. Uh, and, you know, have stop signs and other kinds of things. But we didn't say, for example, what kinds of vehicles could be on the road. We didn't say what the vehicles could carry. We didn't say anything about what buildings there were at the side of the road and what they had in them and what people could do there. We basically gave them this sort of road system. Uh, and, and then it's up to them uh, to decide how to make use of it. And that's sort of very much like the way the road system literally works. We have additional uh, rules of the road, not just technical ones, but policy rules that say don't speed, don't make turns without signaling, uh, stop for pedestrians. We have a bunch of rules. We even make people take a test before they can get a license to use the road system so that we have some assurance that they know what the rules are. Now, I'm not arguing we should have an internet driver's license exactly, but I think people should be educated about how to use this system in a safe way, how to defend themselves and to recognize, you know, if, if you see a, a crazy driver on the road, usually it's a good idea to avoid them. Um, and uh, you might even go so far as to call the law enforcement people to say there's a drunken driver on the road and it's unsafe for everyone. So uh, I think whether the, I, the analogy is not perfect, but I think it's not too terrible. Uh, so I don't take too much responsibility for people's decision to behave badly in this online environment. It's, a, it's an enabling tool, just like a hammer. And you can hammer a nail and build a house, or I guess you could hammer somebody's head. And, and the, it's, it's the decision by the hammer holder what to do with it. Okay, so you're a master of analogies, and I'm loving all your analogies. Uh, I mean, but listen, go, going back to the to the kind of 
discussion well, when you're talking about kind of the internet being a creator of roads of highways now something that is just barreling down those highways is data and um, kind of the e-commerce week which we're part of today uh, kind of pays special attention to that issue of data and harnessing it for development so in terms of the SDGs of climate change pandemics making economies work better so how would you say how I don't how do you evaluate the job that is being done today currently in terms of handling that data uh, and how can that generate more benefit for the world? Well, we do know, we, we discovered that when you have data, when you have information, when you have measurements, uh, you can use that information to understand how things work. I mean, science is that way. We have we formulate our theories based on what we can observe. We make measurements and we ask, how did that happen? Or why does it happen that way? And then we build a theory. And then we test the theory by saying, well, let's do this experiment. Let's predict what the results are. And of course, if the predictions are not borne out by the experiment, we have to decide, is our theory bad or did we do a bad experiment? The same argument can be made for the kinds of enormous amounts of data that are being uh, generated uh, in the online environment. We can use that information to help us understand what's happening in the world. If, in terms of global warming, for example, the kinds of measurements we can do will help us figure out what's actually going on. What are the real dynamics? How do I, how do I represent what the data is telling me in some way that lets me predict what will happen if we don't make changes, for example, in the introduction of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? All of the data tells us it's going to get warmer and there are all kinds of side effects as a result. So uh, there is this positive aspect of data. But then there's also a term you probably know called the data broker. And this is someone who is accumulating the, what's called digital exhaust, the sort of what's left behind when you interacted with the internet and applications that are on the, web, on, on the World Wide Web. And you leave behind this detritus, which can be collected. And that information can tell us a lot about your interests and you know, where you are and what you, what you want to do. And that information might be of interest to other people. And so data brokers basically accumulate this stuff and then sell it to other people. And that's created a fairly big back, backlash. People are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, why should other people have knowledge about what I'm doing? We shouldn't have to know I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to be exposed. Uh, my actions on the net shouldn't have to be exposed if it isn't necessary. Now, it's, it's true, however, if you're ordering something uh, to be delivered to you, you need to give them an address to deliver it to. Then maybe a phone number to call in case there's a problem, or maybe your email address. And some people will say, well, that's private. And I'll say, yes, I know, but you had to share it in order to get the service you wanted. But then it's the an obligation of the party that has that information to protect it as opposed to giving it away or selling it to somebody else. And so we need rules that uh, allow us to assure the users that their information is properly treated. And it's an ever evolving process, isn't it? I guess in terms of the, inf it's an information mine, the, the information that can be mined and how that is protected. And that also comes in terms of security as well, because well, we were just talking about it a few moments ago and it feels that, in terms of security of the internet, and I don't know what you think about this, but it always feels we, we're a kind of a step behind. The internet's always being retrofitted in some respects to keep up with what could be the latest attack. So if we just look at that issue of security, what keeps you up at night when you kind of worry about how it, the internet could be misused? So, uh, well, first of all, in the early days, of course, um, we all knew each other. There was a small group of people and we all wanted to get it to work. It didn't occur to us that somebody would want to wreck it and prevent it from working or interfere with it. Now, even though we were building this uh, for the American Defense Department and it was intended to be the underlying infrastructure for a command and control system, which plainly requires all kinds of security, cryptography, strong authentication and the like, we didn't incorporate all of those things in at the very beginning because it wasn't clear anything was going to work. And so, uh, and remember, this is graduate students who are doing the work. 
the last people in the world you would choose to be careful about their cryptographic keys and all the other security practices it would be a bunch of graduate students who are just trying to figure out how to get their dissertations done and then get out of school. So uh, I knew that those could be retrofitted into the system. And some people will say, well, that's stupid. You should have put it in to begin with. I don't really believe that we would have gotten off the ground if we had dictated that everyone follow really good security practices at the beginning when we're trying to get just figure out how to make it work at all. Now, of course, it's a different story. It's proliferated dramatically. We clearly need cryptography in order to protect confidentiality, and we use it all the time. If you go to a website and if, if you don't type it, implicitly it's going to say HTTPS is secure and it's going to encrypt the traffic. We encrypt all of our traffic on our Google Cloud and we encrypt it when it's at rest as well as when it's in transit. These are all powerful tools and they need to be part of the uh, infrastructure in order to protect privacy and confidentiality to strongly authenticate parties. By the way, I just want to put in a plug for two-factor authentication. It is inconvenient, but it's really important to make it hard for someone to pretend to be you. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's infuriating, but I agree with you. <laughs> and it, 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 it is, you don't want someone to take actions on your behalf that you didn't authorize. And so you want to make it hard for them to pretend to be you. We can try to make it easier and easier for you to invoke this strong authentication, but it's absolutely essential. And some people say, well, we need back doors into the crypto in order to do law enforcement. <coughs> My experience is that if you try to do anything <clears throat> um, and, uh, like that and keep it secret, eventually the secret leaks and now nobody's safe. And so back doors are a bad idea. Uh, we do need security and we need cryptography in order to protect it. We still need law enforcement agreements as well, but there are lots of ways of um, dealing with some bad behaviors, even if we don't have the back door. Uh, just to give you a tiny example, do you remember the uh, Colonial Pipeline um, ransomware attack? The problem there uh, was that um, the uh, Colonial Pipeline, after its data was encrypted, uh, couldn't operate. It needed the data in order to operate, so they shut down. Of course, that meant no uh, oil or gas was flowing on the east coast of the U.S., mm -hmm. and suddenly the economy shut down after several days. So a tremendous um, a snowballing effect or cascade effect. Uh, and of course, the ransomware guys got some money, <clears throat> but then the FBI, if I've understood the story correctly, looked at the blockchain, figured out whose public keys were used in order to get the money. And then they figured out who belonged to the public keys. And they managed to go find the wallets that had the Bitcoins in them and steal them back. So much for, you know, because the, yeah. the whole idea behind blockchain is that the entire transaction history is visible to everybody. That's its whole design. So anyway, I mean, the whole point here is that just thinking that, that crypto is going to keep you from being exposed may not necessarily be true. And then I'm going to change tack a bit because time is just like racing by. So um, I, I we were talking just before we came on air, let's say, uh, about kind of fragmentation of the internet and possibilities of that. And I wrote a question I found very interesting, uh, and and that was suggestions uh, by Ukraine during in the early stages of the war that Russia. Uh, should be disconnected uh, from the global internet, that that should be done by ICANN. Uh, that would clearly have far reaching implications on so many levels. Um, but I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, even in the worst of conditions, we've historically maintained communication, whether it's telegraphy or telephony. And the reason for that is that we know that eventually the conflict will end and we are going to have to find a way to come together again to negotiate what the peace terms are. And so my view is that internet connectivity is like that. We need to keep it there. It needs to be part of the infrastructure so that we can use it uh, to recover and to use it post-recovery. So I don't think that I, I can correctly said we are not going to drop the .ru or .rf or .su from the uh, top level domain space. That doesn't mean that they are in agreement with what the Russians are doing. It just means that we believe that this infrastructure needs to be in place for, you know, you know during the conflict to help end the conflict and to handle the post-conflict uh, communications. 
So uh, that's not the right solution. And it sets a terrible precedent because if ICANN were forced by any particular government to take some other government's visibility out of the internet, uh, then that sets a precedent that ICANN can be uh, co-opted. And that's a terrible idea because then people with too many different uh, conflicting views could interfere with the ability to make the internet work. Now there's a separate isolation possibility though. We're talking about domain names, but you know, the, the Russians can certainly cut themselves off from the rest of the internet if they want to. All they have to do is turn off all their communication channels that go outside across the borders and they can have their own internet inside Russia. And in fact, they tried to figure out how to do that. So and yeah, so it would be a sovereign decision for you, yeah. but certainly not a decision yeah. imposed by another entity. That's in right. Space. That's yeah, right. because that, that can happen where there are so we're talking, we're discussing about that earlier. Um, but if we keep and keep hold of this issue of communication and how uh, well, communication channels are vital and how I guess they're evolving day to day, particularly in terms of what the internet can uh, offer us. And here I'm thinking about the metaverse. Uh, so it's again, another bit of a change of tack, but it's full steam ahead when it comes to the metaverse. It's an issue I find I have difficulty getting my head around, I have to say. <laughs> but um, if we think about AI, there are a lot of worries when, it's come, when it comes to AI in terms of inherent bias. Um, and that's been very difficult to rectify. How concerned are you with the development of the metaverse that issues like bias could be translated into it? Uh, and given that it is the metaverse and well, an issue I can grasp for a second, yeah, how I, dangerous would that be? I have three minutes left to describe the entire universe in 25 <laughs> words or less uh, and give three examples. First of all, we're conflating things. So let me separate metaverse okay. is play an environment of the artificial. And it could even incorporate some of reality that you've heard of augmented reality before, where you see the real world and then you see imposed on it information about the real world. That's, that's augmented reality. The metaverse tends to be virtual reality, where we create an artificial three-dimensional space and we are able to interact with the digital objects that are in that environment. Uh, uh, now, you, you then dumped AI and machine learning, actually, into the picture. Let me separate that out. Machine learning uh, works right now by ingesting huge amounts of examples of data and then trying to uh, use that data, for example, for image recognition or for pattern recognition of some sort. And we know that we can make it work really, really well if we have good uh, representative statistical data from the real world around us. Now, if, however, the data is, uh, is limited for some reason, if it's biased, then what we learn is biased and our decisions and our recognition of imagery will be biased as well. So for example, we might fail to recognize a cancerous cell because we weren't trained to see the particular examples that the real world presents us because we didn't have the data to train the machine learning algorithm. So there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that the data that we use to train machine learning algorithms is, is sufficiently representative of the real world so that our decisions or our uh, classifications actually are, uh, are representative of what real world should tell us. So we have to be thoughtful about that. And I have to say in the last few seconds here that machine learning methods are brittle. They sometimes break. And we should be well aware that there are risks associated with using the technology unless you take into account the possibility that it will not work as advertised sometimes. Wow, amazing how you condensed all that information in, into a very brief answer and one I actually understood. Listen, I'm, I'm going to tap you just for one extra minute because uh, there's so many people who are going to be listening to you now. And I guess we haven't spoken about the younger generations, all these guys who will be living these technologies really in very different ways than we can even begin to imagine if we see how the internet's involved. Uh, what would you like to tell them, I guess? What would be your message to them? Because it's a landscape that's full of promise, but one also full of risks. Uh, indeed, and I think you've captured exactly the right message, which is that there are enormous opportunities. That this is basically software. Everything that we're talking about is basically software. And my view is that software is an endless frontier. There's nothing 
there, there's no limitation beyond what you can figure out what, how to program, which is what drew me into computing in the first place. You, you could create your own little universe and it did what you told it to do. Of course, then you very quickly learned it does what you told it to do. That might not be the same as what you wanted it to do. And the difference between those is called a bug. And you learn very early on, it's easy to create bugs and it's hard to find them. So I think if I were to leave uh, the young folks who might be listening to this uh, with a thought, it is that there's enormous opportunity in this online software-based environment. Your, your imagination is the one of your skills of programming uh, are the only boundary conditions. The, the opportunity to do useful things for people is also unlimited uh, in this environment. So the, the whole artificial world uh, has enormous potential, but it also has potential hazard because you can do bad things with the same enabling technology as you can do good things. And so we need to teach people how to distinguish the beneficial things to do versus the harmful things, minimize the latter, and emphasize the former. A fascinating, fascinating conversation and a real privilege to have had this half hour with you. I hope everybody else has enjoyed this as much as me. I'm sure you have. Um, and Vincef, I'm going to continue following you and everything you're doing, as I have been doing for the last few years. So thank you very, very much. And um, I hope to speak to you again before not too long. Bye-bye, would... everybody. Bye-bye, Isabel. Thank you so much. What an enjoyable chat. Lovely chat. Thank you. Bye-bye.